sweet love it's the only thing that there's just too little love what the world needs now is love sweet love no not just for some but for What the world needs now is love. And so I want to apologize right up front that uh, over the course of the next five weeks, that tune is going to invade your brain. It's going to invade your brain. It's going to take up space in your brain. And whether you want to or not, that tune is going to come out of your mouth at just the most random times. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. This Advent season, we are going to be asking this question, what does the world need now? And we're going to be ask, answering the question with the four Christmas virtues, uh, the virtue of hope, peace, joy, and love. I think we would all be quick to agree that, yes, the world needs some hope, peace, joy, and love. Somebody ought to get on that. It's fairly easy to say that from our couches and from our recliners, but we're going to raise the bar of expectation a little bit uh, because what the world needs is you and I to inject that hope, peace, joy, and love that comes from following Christ. You see, what the world needs is a very special kind of person, a peculiar kind of people, a Christ-like following people is what the world needs now a people who are going to cling in hope to the promises of God. No matter what comes against them, they're going to stubbornly cling in hope. When the world says, give up, let go, let go of that rope, let go of the anger, why bother? The world needs some people who are going to keep holding on. What the world needs now are some people of peace. People who, who don't treat Jesus' command to love your enemy and to turn the other cheek and to forgive as you've been forgiven just as some sentimental platitude, but as actually the expectation and command of God. People of peace who marshal all of their strength to be agents of peace in a world that's marked by aggression and violence. What the world needs now is people of joy, people whose cups run over with joy. And it's not that these people don't ever experience hardship or trial or suffering. Actually, some of the most joy-filled people are the people who have suffered the most. But these are people that if you poke them, if the world pokes them, what oozes out is the Spirit of God, the joy-filled Spirit of God. What the world needs now is, is people of love, people who love like Christ loved, people who love sacrificially, people who love with a servant's heart, people whose love is steadfast and unwavering, people who will love the least of these. Ultimately, we all know that what the world needs now is Jesus, but Jesus has sent us. Jesus has, has called us to, to be his hands and feet, to reach out to the world. So if that's not a, a reason for us to pray at the, at the advent of this series, I don't know what it is, so would you join me as we, as we pray? Lord, uh, in your wisdom, when you ascended into heaven, you sent your spirit to fill us. You've called your church and all those who recognize you as Savior and Lord to be your witnesses to this world. Lord, the world does need you, and you've sent us. Father, in our weakness, we don't feel up to the task. We pray that you would use us through the power of your Spirit. We pray that you would transform us so that we might be more useful to you. We thank you that you haven't stopped loving this world, even though this world has rebelled against you. And as we go now to your word, we ask that your word would be our rule, your spirit would be our God, guide, and your glory would be our chief ambition. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
One of the uh, baby cribs here says faith, hope, and love. Uh, one of our, our favorite scriptures is 1 Corinthians 13, and it ends with this verse. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. Of these three, hope is that middle child that often gets overlooked, that gets lost in the fray. Faith and love, these demand attention. Without faith, the scripture says, it's impossible to please God. And love, well, the greatest of these is love. God is love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Yes to faith. Yes to love. But what about hope? Is it possible that, that maybe we've minimized the value and our need for hope? that we've downplayed the power of hope in this world, that we've underestimated the need this world has for hope? I think so. Hopelessness abounds. I mean, anywhere you look, you're going to find some hopelessness. There are so many things that we bump up against in this world that, that can instill a sense of hopelessness. Uh, about five years ago, Pastor Rick Warren did a a devotional, 40 Days of Hope. And in preparing for that devotional, he did a, a survey, he surveyed a whole bunch of people, and he wanted to come up with what are the, the leading causes of hopelessness. And he came up with a list of 10 things that I want to just quickly go through with you and see if you can identify with any of these. Uh, these aren't in any order, it's just a list of 10 things. So one is, is feeling alone. Like for an extended period of time, and this doesn't mean necessarily being isolated. You can feel alone in a crowd. But that sense of, of, I'm all alone, it's not good, God declared, for us to be alone. That can instill hopelessness. Two, when, when life seems out of control, and there's this feeling that it's never going to change, there's nothing I can do about it, I have no control, that can instill hopelessness. Three, when we don't see a purpose in anything, the sun rises, the sun sets, we wake up, we go to sleep, we just do the same thing day in and day out, and we don't see meaning or purpose or significance. Four, when we're confronted with a major loss, a loved one dies. Five, when we don't have what we need. We have some, some concrete needs, and we just don't have what is necessary to meet those needs. Six, when we're unable to forgive ourselves. And so we live in shame, and we live with this constant weight of guilt. We can become hopeless. Seven, when we're being or have been abused. Eight, when we're addicted to something that is self-destructive, and we just can't break free of its grasp. A sense of hopelessness can seep in. Nine, when we live in chronic fear whether that fear is real or imaginary, when we leave in, live in chronic fear. And 10, when we consistently feel defeated, like everything we try, nothing works. It seems like we're losing at every turn. Now that is quite a list. And, and I imagine that a few of those statements probably have resonated with you. Maybe at different points in your life, you could say, yep, I, I've experienced that, or you know somebody who has ex experienced that. Hopelessness is an invisible, life-sucking enemy that has a stranglehold on this world. What the world needs now is people whose hope is contagious. People who are holding on to that anchor and, and their desire, their resolve to hold on to that anchor is contagious. So let's talk about hope. What is hope? Let's first say what is, what is not hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Uh, so I will confess that the Stefan family is that family that when the lottery gets to about $400 million, we go buy a ticket. Anything less than $400 million, it's just, you know, not worth it. But $400 million or, or above, we will go and buy that ticket, and then we'll actually check to see if we have the right numbers. Just there's that little ounce of, of hope. And so far, God has fortunately spared us 
from winning the thing because I'm pretty sure it would mess up our lives. That's not hope. That's wishful thinking. Hoping for a parking place up close to the store when it's raining out, that's not hope. That's wishful thinking. And there's nothing wrong with with wishful thinking. Wish for a green light instead of a red light. Wish for warm weather. Wish away, but you better not build your life on wishful thinking. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is also not the same as optimism. Optimism is a great thing. I'd say it's better than pessimism. But what optimism does is is it says, look on the bright side. Just train yourself to look on the bright side. Be that, that glass is half full type of person. Sometimes optimism is not grounded in reality. We want to say that things aren't as bad as, they, as you think, but when in reality they are, and maybe they're even worse. Optimism is a mindset which is capable of only carrying us so far. It doesn't have the same gravity as biblical hope. And eventually, the most optimistic person is going to come to the end of their optimistic rope. So what is biblical hope? Well, I want to turn to two passages. The first is from Hebrews, and it says this, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Let me say that again. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In this three-child family of faith, hope, and love, faith and hope are twins. Maybe not identical twins, but they're twins. And what I mean by that is that they are so closely linked, faith and hope, that you cannot have one without the other. You cannot be a person of faith if you're not a person of hope. And you cannot be a person who, who's characterized by hope if you're not a person of faith. Let's return to a story that we're familiar with now, the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah saying to King Nebuchadnezzar, who is threatening to throw them into the fiery furnace, O king, if you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God is able to save us. That's faith. We believe, we have no doubt that if you do this, our God is able to save us. Hope. Even if he doesn't, we're going to trust him. and We're not going to bow down to that, that statue. You see, faith and hope, they exist in kind of this yin-yang type of relationship where it's hard to tell one from the other. Their foundation is the same. They both are rested in the fact of the, the trustworthiness of God. Here's the, the question that we've got to ask. Can I trust God? Have you resolved, can I trust God? Is God reliable? Is God dependable? Is God going to do what he said he's going to do? Is he going to act in a way that he says he's going to act? Is God going to keep his promises? Sometimes we sing about God being a, a way maker and a promise keeper. Do we believe those words? Is God a promise keeper? Faith is how we answer those questions. I believe. I believe God is dependable. I believe God keeps his promises. I believe God is trustworthy. I believe God's going to do what he said he's going to do. I believe God has integrity. Hope, then, is how we show up in this world based on the fact that we believe these things. We believe it is... God is a God who keeps his promises. So the scripture gives us an example of this. In Hebrews chapter 6, the scripture provides us Abraham as an example of a man who had faith and hope. And so we're going to turn to that Hebrews 6 verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. This is God making a promise. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now, notice everything begins with the promise. 
The origin of that story is not Abraham. This is not about Abraham's faith. This is about the promise of God. Abraham didn't have faith in his faith. I've got great faith. This is going to happen because of my faith. He had faith in the promise of God. This hope wasn't just an optimistic outlook. You know, my wife's getting a little bit older. I I sure hope we, we have a child. Abraham's faith and hope is planted in the soil of a promise that God has made. I will bless you. I will bless you. And I will give you many descendants. And so Abraham had to answer the same question that you and I have to answer. Can I trust God? Is he dependable? Is God a promise keeper? And in faith, Abraham believed that the answer to those questions was yes. And so he hoped. He lived in hope, waiting patiently for God to fulfill his promise. We continue reading. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. Now, there's a lot in that passage. One thing that I love about that passage is that that God wants to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. In other words, God's not playing games with us. He doesn't want us to to be guessing at at what his will is. Uh, Often I will cite that passage from Isaiah that says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. And and that passage is true. There is, God is mysterious, and we don't understand how he acts in this world. But what is equally true is that God has made some promises, and he wants us to be very clear about them. He doesn't want there to be any mystery doesn't want there to be any ambiguity. And so he makes these promises. Over 7,000 promises in the scripture are made to us. And so the question that confronts us is not, what has God promised? All we have to do is read the scripture to find that out. The question is, am I going to trust him? Am I going to trust God? Is God reliable? Is he trustworthy? Can I put my hope in him and not have the rug pulled out from underneath me? So what are some of those promises? I just came up with a few off the top of my head. Here's one. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you and will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. One of the causes of hopelessness, Rick Warren said, was living with this perpetual sense of shame and guilt. Well, what's the antidote to that? Here it is. God has promised to forgive you. He is faithful. It means he's going to do it every single time. If you confess your sins, he will forgive you. That's a promise. Can you trust him? Will you trust him? Here's another one. I will never leave you. I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. One of the biggest causes of hopelessness is that sense of being alone. I'm all alone, and God is saying, you will never be all alone, because I am always going to be with you. How about this one? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise. Do you ever struggle with your wondering, am I really saved? Am I really saved? When you're asking yourself that question, your focus is on you. And you need to turn your focus around to God because he's made a promise. And he's not going to pull the rug out from under you. If you have called on the name of the Lord, God promises you are saved. Put your trust and hope in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How about this one? This is a favorite of many from Philippians 4. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Bring your burdens to the Lord and he will comfort you. It's a promise that we have from God. Here's one. This is a, just a, an introduction to next week. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. That's a promise. Peacemakers will be blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If you believe that promise to be true, it's going to impact how you show up in this world. So the reason we have hope in God is because God is unchangeable, immutable. His word is irrevocable. God does not lie. So if he has said something and he says, I will, then you can count on it. He will because he is a God of integrity. Verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. There's not a person on this planet who doesn't need an anchor for their soul. Because apart from that anchor, somebody said it, we drift. Apart from that anchor, we can't help but drift. We're going to drift from one thing to the next to the next, and we're going to always feel like there's something missing. That, that sense of purpose, that sense of meaning, that sense of significance, that thing for which we were created. Without our anchor, we just drift. Apart from the anchor, we're vulnerable. The winds crash in, and, and our boat is going to capsize if we don't have that anchor. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. The passage continues this way, that it's firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. So I just want you to imagine this in your mind. Your your boat is your life, and you're in your boat, and you've got an anchor But instead of dropping that anchor overboard and it sinking down to the bottom of the the ocean, your anchor casts up to heaven. And your anchor goes into the throne room of God where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And that anchor locks on to the throne of God where we have a God who is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, a God who is sovereign over everything And so that anchor locks on and nothing's going to let go of that anchor. And now what the scripture tells to us, tells us to do is take hold. Take hold of it. No matter what hope happens, hold on to that that chain that extends to the throne of God and don't let go. The world could use some people who are determined to do that. Join me as we pray.